Hey there, Power Athlete Nation. No giggling text during the intro. I'm just thinking of JJ Watt. JJ J- Watt. <laughs> you got Luke here. Text hello. And John. Well, John JJ Watt. JJ Watt. I am JJ Watts. <laughs> and uh, you're biggest, you are littlest two. fan in the <laughs> planet. <laughs> biggest like the what's yeah, the oxymoron? I, uh, uh, Reno, the biggest little city in the world. I'm yeah. the littlest, littlest fan. You know, you're the biggest littlest, littlest fan. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, and this is another episode of the Crew Podcast, or Crew episode of the Premier Podcast in Strength and Conditioning. Ing. 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 Yeah, there he is. Well, if John's not going to do it, at least joining us today is Block One coach, uh, physio extraordinaire, Matt Zanis, is going to come and talk to us about something he dreams of daily. Mm. Foot stuff. Foot stuff. Is that like butt stuff? It's, uh, it's a low-key foot fetish. It's a low-key I mean, foot. Like, like, like healthy and functional, right? Yeah. Like, uh, uh, functional. Dude, before but, we get rolling, those um, those insoles that... Uh, Nobosu? Yeah, the... Um, Dr. Emily? Dr. Emily sent us. Uh, they are some of the weirdest weirdest things that like <laughs> like it's funny like in a good every, way every time i wear them i get like a different hot spot on my foot like as i'm wearing i'm like like there's a different spot spot on my foot and i kind of like today it was like my uh right uh pinky toe was just like on fire and then like it'll move like every time i put them on there's like a different hot spot like a piece i feel and it's uh like i don't feel anything in my heel but it's just all on the front of my foot and like on my toes it's such a weird sensation well Likely yeah. those those tissues in the forefoot John haven't been stimulated in a long time or in that way. So their threshold's a little bit lower. You're just you're getting more information and responding to those mechanoreceptors a little bit better. So well, need a little stimulation well, in your life, big guy. Just a little more something something uh, that who who do we have on the podcast where we're talking about the foot um, uh, with the uh, flat feet versus uh, high arch foot? Doctor Mike Martino. Yeah, so at we had, a Georgia College. Yeah, so we we had a call with uh, Mike Martino. And uh, he talked about uh, people with high arches, their foot gets real rigid. And so what I noticed as I was wearing the insoles, when I was walking, uh, like not allowing, like almost like keeping a rigid foot and kind of hitting my heel and then kind of rolling over instead of like more relaxing the foot and then looking for like a midfoot strike. And um, I didn't even realize I got into this pattern until I started yep. wearing those uh, insoles. And then as I started wearing them, I noticed I was like, oh, shit, like I'm putting like I could feel like a tactical feedback of like when I stepped on that heel kind of out, uh, I could feel it. And then I wasn't stimulating like my midfoot. And so it like kind of was like a, a almost like a wake up, like a getting electric shocked almost like an offense yeah. where I was like, man, this is fucking up my gait. And then as I started kind of stretching my feet and doing my little stretching routine, I realized my foot was getting really rigid. And uh, it was just, dude, I'm like. It's amazing that putting like an insole like that in the shoe uh, could have that type of result, man. It kind of blew my mind. Matt, could you explain the Nabosu insole? So Dr. Emily did an awesome job of breaking down the foot for us. We didn't, it was too early for us to get into the insole, and we were gone for like two hours mm-hmm. that show. But she gifted us these. Can you explain to our listeners what these are? Yeah. Yeah, Emily's great. She actually moved out here to Arizona, so we get to get together pretty regularly now. Um, but what those insoles do is they'll provide more proprioceptive feedback into the brain, into the nervous system. So many, many of us go throughout our entire lives with these big cushiony shoes and never really experience what it's like to touch the ground. So we have uh, the highest amount of mechanoreceptors and proprioceptors down anywhere in the body in the bottom of the foot, yet we never stimulate them. So what these insoles do will start to stimulate those mechanoreceptors, send more information to the brain that tells the brain actually how to move the body better. So it improves the biomechanics of the whole system. Mm -hmm. And for listeners to see these, it's Mm nabosutechnology.com, and she has gifted us or our listeners 20% off. Yep. Yep. Show notes. notes. Uh, Imagine like an insole that has uh, hundreds of little tiny kind of uh, rubber spikes almost. Golf like, spikes. Yeah, mm-hmm. like like these little raised kind of nubs. I mean, it's not painful. You put them on, it's kind of like a, just like a nice massage. But then as you start wearing them over extended periods of time, like I have, like you'll all of a sudden like notice your gait change and like uh, all of a sudden there'll be random hot spots where now all of a sudden am I rolling too far this way? Am I, am I rolling off like, because I think what a lot of people do is they roll off their uh, side of their foot and don't press through their big toe. 
And I think um, as we've been sitting here talking, I wonder if part of the arthritic big toe comes from people not wanting to roll over their big toe, kind of rolling off of the side to try to, you know, and maybe the big toe gets kind of rigid because it's not being used. Yeah, it doesn't have to go into extension at all. And just to be clear, like that big toe, that rigid lever is supposed to be used for push off. That's why it's so freaking big and robust. Yet if you look down at the bottom of your feet, your calluses will tell you a story about how you're walking. So most people, if you reach underneath, you're going to find some hard kind of skin buildup around the second and the third toe. So if we don't push off the big toe, like you said, John, you're going to roll through that outside edge mm -hmm. and then come in. You have to come in at some point, but your foot is acting more like a flipper and just kind of rolling to the inside and you're pushing off the second and the third toe. So that's where you start to develop all your calluses and it throws off the whole entire extensor mechanism. So you never really get your leg behind you. You need up developing this pattern that looks like a, like a penguin waddling. Really. Well, that, well uh, let's, why, why don't we just oh. jump into the question real quick? Yeah, that's fine. And like, so our listeners know wh what we're talking why the, about. Yeah, why the hell we're talking about this? Because our buddy Justin, longtime listener, uh, first time caller, hit up the Power Athlete Radio Hotline, which is open, baby. It's open twenty four seven for you to call up, ask us a question, leave us some love. The only weird part is it's actually a message machine at your house. So it's like, boop. Oh, no, yeah. I, I rewound the tapes. And, yeah, you know. yeah, you brought the tapes in just like in college. So I dug out my uh, That's right. answering the, machine. The number for the hotline is 929-464-4640. That's 929-ing-ing-zero. <laughs> I don't know. Right? That's like That is the uh, pinnacle at, uh, as seen on TV. Uh, oh, I thought you were going like to say the dumbest back. thing we've ever done, but I was going to say no, there's, there's plenty of dumber things we've done than this. So there's a, there's a radio ad in Chicago for uh, like Copiers USA, and it's like that number is 646 Copiers, you know, like the <laughs> Chicago Ditka accent. Um, but that's ing, ing, zero. Is it the same guy that does the Dicky Portillo? Basically. Is that an, enough numbers? I don't copiers. That's all I know. Text two S's. <laughs> copiers. Well, yeah, there's also an, a bunch of extra vowels and copiers. Yeah, you gotta. You know, you'll figure it out. Just yeah. keep calling. It's we'll Chicago get, land talk. Us, we'll get you to copy. Sound it okay? Out. Yeah. Like uh, <laughs> when we go to Dickie Portillo's and all of a sudden Luke just slipped right back into fucking Chicago uh, land. Two dogs, beef dipped, <laughs> hot peppers, uh, and a mots. link, and a link, cake shake. <laughs> oh jeez. Uh, How dare you bring starving. up a cake shake? <laughs> all right, here we go. Enough about Portillo's and copiers. Let's talk to Luke, Tex, John, it's Justin calling from Australia. I have a question. I've just watched the Cal Dietz video from the Power Athlete Symposium in 2019, and it's mind-blowing to say the least. My question is, what are the effects of an arthritic toe on all his spring ankle movements? And what are the ways to mitigate that or to strengthen that or indeed work through it? Uh, that's my question. Thanks, guys. Thank you, Justin. And thank you, all of our loyal listeners. He follows up with uh, next voicemail that it is his left toe, left big, big toe. toe. Yeah. That is the toe that is suffering from... Um, from the arthritic issue and Cal Dietz presented at 2019 symposium. For those who don't know, it was our end of the year uh, bash where we would bring all of the uh, people that we encountered over the past year or so to come out and educate our coaches and uh, loyal followers. And Cal was one of those guys. The thing I think is interesting is that he had to call back and tell us it was his big toe when I looked and there was really no research associated with arthritic toes outside of the big toe, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is kind of an interesting point. And as you were talking earlier, Matt, um, and I only know this from ACL rehab, they do talk about a lot of midfoot pushing over because people starting to roll over or even like club foot to try to get their knee to stop mm -hmm. bending. So I'm wondering if this is like a, a knee injury or something above chain and kind of like looking at it, is it like, is this the downstream effect of uh, some, maybe some other injuries or some other shitty mechanics? So before we get there, Matt, so Tex, what are the five, what, what are Dietz's spring ankle movements? Okay, these are five positions uh -huh. and it's an opportunity to get isometric strength within these positions that you're going to find on the field. So position number one, and these are a progression from one to yeah. five, and you'll see as I introduce them, they feel more difficult. And uh, these are also in his triphasic sprint manual, and he okay. presented it at Summer Strong as well. Oh, okay. Yes. Cool. Five, yeah, the five positions. And you can find these on YouTube. Yep. On the big screen. Yep. Okay, number one, <laughs> two feet. So two feet in dorsiflexion, you're going to step onto a plate or an object with a lip 
that you can keep your heels elevated, but you're going to step onto the plate. You're going to have both legs extended, and you're going to mash your body down, breaking at the ankle, the knee, and the hip. So both feet are together. You're in dorsiflexion, and it's an isometric hold, mm -hmm. mashing those feet down. Position number two, you still start extended, and your key word is you're going to load into these positions. You're going to place two feet on. You're going to load into one foot plantar flexion. And I remember a key phrase uh, that Dietz wanted, two feet load into position, and then you take one foot off. Okay. So the next position is one foot in plantar flexion, but load into both feet. With leg straight. No, no, he, he wants the, the, uh, oh, the, the low down. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And breaking at the hip. Number three is one foot dorsiflexion. So same progression, two feet on, load into dorsiflexion and remove one foot. Number four is two feet plantar flexion. Oh. So load into the bottom and then raise up into plantar flexion on both feet and hold. And making sure, and I'm sure Zanus will, will touch on this, you're really bending and breaking at that big toe. So when mm -hmm. I say plantar flexion, I mean really trying to get that ankle as, as straight as possible and breaking at that big toe. Um, it's a note for Zanus. And then number five is one foot plantar flexion so two feet load into raise up into plantar flexion remove one foot and then you got a little buddy system a partner will press down mm -hmm. straight down with force and you're resisting maintaining an isometric hold against your buddy's body weight mm -hmm. and we we use some of this in the programming right john like, yeah we, we kind of disguise a little bit but yeah um it just one of my notes is uh, we need to probably go back uh, and kind of upgrade or, or even add some more elements. So uh, on Johnny Bod, uh, we started kind of figuring out different ways that we could use Cal's foot stuff, but kind of despise it or disguise it as calf work, and it's really foot strengthening. Um, it's uh, it, but there's some pretty good, interesting ones and like some different variations that actually I need you to film. So we'll have to film no those problem. There, we do have some projects mm -hmm. in correcting some videos, and we experienced these. Movements and exercises 2018 Caldeets yeah. and started to work them into the program. So we have room now that we understand better, thanks to our friends Matt Zanis, well, to implement these. The, uh, the, the biggest issue came down to and where all this really stems from is 99.9% .9 of the world, uh, you know, our contact with this earth is through the foot. And a weak foot became this kind of, uh, you know, almost like deal breaker for everything up chain. So you want to be able to sprint, you want to be able to move dynamic, change of direction, all these things. It has to start with having a healthy, mobile, strong, flexible foot that's able to not only, you know, eccentric load, concentric, but also hold isometric contractions. So I think going back and really analyzing and looking at the foot as our first meaningful touch uh, really has changed a lot of people's trajectory on how they're on how they're approaching this stuff. Whereas I think today, if you're not discussing the foot, um, you know, strength coaches that are, you know. You're behind? Yeah, I, I think you're way behind. I think you're 10 years behind. Um, it was something that as soon as he talked to us about it, we were like, you know, and then it took me back then up to obviously told the story about uh, uh, the podiatrist I, I worked with in 99 when I first went to the Eagles talking about, you know, you got to make sure your feet are stable. You got to make sure that they're, they're flexible. And if you can do that, you'll be able to maintain foot health. Um, you know, walking around barefoot, picking up jacks and like all the other uh, drills that he showed me. So um, it's amazing when you see this stuff come full circle and you realize that there's people that are, you know, kind of you know, pushing this thing at, a, at an interesting pace. So, Matt, well, maybe you could dig in. One thing we were kind of wrapping on before we hopped on is like, OK, so this arthritic toe, what does that even mean? Is it legit? How do people find themselves with this arthritic big toe? Yada, yada, yada. You do your thing. Yeah. So. I think in, to better understand what's going on, on at the big toe, we have to understand how the, the biomechanics are actually happening and occurring at the foot with movement. Because like you said, John, like you're disguising calf work or footwork as calf work. Well, every movement that we do, every exercise that we do is a foot exercise if you are calling attention to the foot as well. Because it will stimulate literally every single pattern up the rest of the kinetic chain. And I'm gonna make things really, really easy for you guys and for people out there. There are only two foot shapes that occur. You've got a pronating foot and you've got a supinating foot. That's it. They're still moving through three different planes of motion, but there are 26 bones and 33 joints down there at the foot, so there's a lot going on. And it's more than just what people typically um, refer to as pronation, pronating or pronation or supination, which is like this paddle motion, right? So if you picture like my hand kind of reaching through the, the video camera there, it's either my big toe being down, my pinky toe coming up, 
which would be like that big toe, or sorry, the uh, pronating shape versus the supinating shape, which is that pinky toe touching yet the big toe comes off. Mm -hmm. But that's that's an incomplete movement, right? So we, we're not really getting the, the full picture and the excursion that's happening between the two shapes. And I Is think that, that making sense? Yeah, and what's something you said there is pretty profound is I think we look at like the big lifts and we look at our training, like I do, that everything, every single base of support or any sort of transitional base of support where your foot makes contact, removes contact, re-instantiates contact, or is your base support through squatting, you're training your foot. You're, well, yeah, you're yeah, doing it's, it's a, a rep. Well, it's like a boxer, like not training his fist. Yeah, yeah. You know, like if you're going to reach out and touch somebody, that first meaningful touch, the first thing that's going to hit is going to be the, uh, the fist. And, you know, we know we talk about fit, uh, like uh, position on punching. You got to line up those two knuckles with your bone. If it alternates here, you can break your wrist. I mean, so it's the same uh, same deal. And I, I think I told you guys when I was playing, uh, I would notice offensive linemen that would like, uh, as they got into position, would lift their big toe and play on their heel. And when they did it, they could never mm -hmm. accept a bull rush. I mean, unless they were 400 mm -hmm. pounds and like at that point, just yeah. mass on mass. <laughs> but like I know for me, I had to press my big toe in the ground and make sure my big toe was, both big toes were in the ground so I could take on bull rushes mm -hmm. and do this. And they always made a good point. Like uh, um, you're, you know, for a dude who's not 350, like you play like you are. And I'm like, well, yeah, because I'm anchored into the ground. I'm able to grab the ground and use the big toe. And I knew I couldn't fire my glute without a big toe. Mm -hmm. And I knew that from, from lifting weights. And so there's still football coaches out there teaching, you know, I want you to play on your heels. I don't want, you know, like lift your big toe, play on your heel. And it was such a shitty, uh, like, technique. But at the end of the day, that's why they want guys to be 400 pounds. So they yeah. don't necessarily have to teach this stuff. So, Matt, there's there's still – go ahead. I so said there's still a lot of people being taught how to squat that way too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Push everything out of the heels and just drive your knees out. So on that note, there's this complex series of joints and bones mm -hmm. that you said have implications upstream. Yeah. So dudes who might think they have weak hamstrings or weak quads or weak glutes or a weak trunk or a weak upper back, is it possible that that is just the foot is unable to make these shapes at the right time to yeah. – to, so it's – yeah, it's more of a motor control issue, right? And, and to make this really clear for people, pronation and supination is just like an octopus kind of swimming through the water. So the tentacles are going out or coming together. So if the tentacles are going flat to the ground and they're extending out and flattening to the, to the earth, that's your pronation. And when the tentacles come up and you get this suction cup action going on, that's your supination. But everything is moving together. And you still have, you can think of your foot as like a tripod. So three points of contact on the big toe knuckle, the fifth toe knuckle, and on the heel, when you have the whole foot on the ground. Now we start talking about Caldeza's stuff and we're having um, the active foot. We're, we're only on the first two uh, points of that tripod. It's a, kind of a, a different story, but the pronation and the supination are then going to change the biomechanics that are happening upstream. So when you have a pronating foot, you're always gonna get a dorsiflexion through the ankle and a bend through the knee. So the knee should be flexing, which will then cause a flexion in the hip and then also a anterior rotation in the pelvis as well versus the supination aspect where now you're getting that rigid lever you're getting that arch to lift up off the ground that's going to cause that knee extension and the hip extension so really put the force into those powerful hip extensors of the hamstrings and the glutes to be able to propel you forward mm -hmm. so so let's tie this back into justin's problem so he's yeah. trying to hit these drills possibly maybe do some of our active footwork on on our programs and I know we do have a guy on Field Strong who's having issues completing some of the active foot stuff, which yes. would be the two primary, like the first toe knuckle, fifth toe knuckle, as your ba primary base of support, heel elevated. So, how, like, what do we got to do with these arthritic toes? What's the deal? So, number one, we got to find out why they actually showed up in the first place, right? There's always going to be some type of a mechanism injury um, or some type of lifestyle choice or pattern in your environment that is causing that big toe essentially become rigid. And then what happens when it, it becomes rigid is the joints aren't opening and closing. They aren't moving, they aren't touching all through three different planes of motion, through the three dimensions that that joint is capable of going through. So what you end up doing is start rubbing away at the very same joint surfaces over and over and over again, with literally every single step you take or any movement that you do. And like anything else, our tissues only have a certain threshold, a certain set point. So you're gonna eventually cross that threshold and you're gonna get all these nasty reactions like the pain, the achiness, um, the stiffness, sometimes even the swelling. Even though there's really no acute injury, you can still get inflammation to go around the joint because that tissue is 
you can't actually um, attenuate any of the forces going through the foot. So it turns into this paddle. When we turn into the paddle, every time that you walk, you're going to roll through the outside edge of that foot, try to come in through the, the, in through the middle of the foot and the midfoot, but you're not going to be able to find your big toe. And that's the problem because that's how we get those bunions to start to form because you essentially roll through the inside edge instead of pushing through. And then like anything else, you got to stress it. And then when you stress it, you're going to start to get adaptations. And is, then these adaptations uh, are oh. negative. Is the bunion acting in such a way as to like extreme the, uh, or to create more surface area on the foot because it like almost like create like a, a fixed point? Because you were talking about like the tripod effect of the big toe. If you see the bunion, all of a sudden the big toe comes in and then the bunion goes this way. So I'm wondering if that's like uh, um, the body's mechanism for, you know, maybe creating a third point that's fixed farther outside like the toe, but like the, the outside of the foot. Yeah, that's starting. It's trying to create a wider base of support. Yeah, that's what so. I was if at. and yeah, and so if you can't if you can't go through the big toe, you can't dorsiflex through that big toe. You're never going to be able to find the windlass mechanism to actually push through the ankle. So the body's just going to like, all right, well, we're just going to turn it out and just bypass it altogether. And we bypass it altogether. We don't have to. We don't have to worry about it, right? But those are our compensation patterns that over time will start to lead to this accelerated tissue damage, and then eventually more compensation patterns or a potential injury. All right. Yeah, bunions are gnarly. Like, man, I've seen people have, like, bunion surgeries. I've had clients. I've played with guys that had bunion injuries. And, uh, dude, that's nothing you want. And then that's important, too, because not a lot of these bunions are actually need to be corrected with surgery. They're not permanent. They're not fixed. They're what we call functional bunions to where if I can put you on the floor standing and take your toe and move it out and put it into a straight position, we can work to achieve a better position out of that toe. Hmm. And then there's a couple different ways that we can go through it. Number one, the very first thing I tell people to do is buy some toe spreaders. So how many pedicures have you had in your life, John? Uh, one. Just You're one. You're missing out, man. Maybe one. Very much Texas zero. But, uh, Texas I, zero. I, uh, John would, is one. I'm in double on. digits. Maybe, maybe two. Too, uh, maybe two. I remember my wife booked them for like uh, Valentine's Day. We went twice since we maybe like here in, uh, in Texas. And I'll tell you, uh, frankly, I think it was wonderful. Yeah. And oh, yeah. I, I just, I, when, one, I'm not like, I just wouldn't think, be like, oh, it's a Wednesday, Luke. Should we go get pedicures? Uh, yes. Yeah, well, maybe we should. Uh, when my buddies came in for my wedding, Jupe and Ski came in, first guys in. I'm, they're like, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to get petties. So it was three dudes, went mm -hmm. to a salon, got some white wine spritzers, sat in that little pedicure chair. And these guys were like, you know, very, very skeptical from the start. And they're like, I don't know. This kind of feels like, I don't know. This. I'm like, you're going to love this shit. And sure enough, dude, converted them. They're double digit pedicure guys now. Uh, it's fantastic. I it, like you it get the little fishies it, that eat all your dead skin. No. Is that that? Text? That's uh, an interesting sensation. So uh, when we were, uh, when we went out to Perdinalis Falls, we were, I was laying in the river. And if you lay there per, like totally still, little fish come over yeah, they'll nibble and, at you. and they, they nibble on you. And uh, it was like the same thing, except, you know, you didn't have to pay 60 bucks for it. You're just a bunch <laughs> of redneck fish in Texas eating little things off your legs. Uh, that's what I like. actually get some leeches, too. Uh, I do. <laughs> Not I, in Texas. I don't think I'll that there's I'll take, any. I'll take bush light and the, the I river I don't think that there's any stigmatism associated with getting a pedicure and taking care of your feet. No. Uh, the uh, dude, like the lady I went to, like, she's like, oh, you have a callus, shaved it down. And then I noticed I had this hot spot, and like all of a sudden, like once you notice that hot spot, which is kind of what those insoles are doing, you got to kind of change your gait and uh, try to find one that's more balanced. So, Tex, I think it'd be good for you. All right, let's go Friday. Good team outing. I'm in. <laughs> I'm in. Let's go. Brew, brew with the crew live so, from so from, the, <laughs> where, from Madam so, Wong's. Yeah, where are we so where are we at with with Justin his arthritic toe and modifications and. Things like that. Well, I think one is uh, he, you know, he didn't give us any inf uh, information about like how he's managing not only this, like if you have swelling and it's such a tiny joint that even a little bit of swelling is going to look pretty massive and start locking <laughs> it down. So how would you manage the swelling? Would you do like some Advil, some Aleve, maybe some ibuprofen, uh, some contrasts? I'm just wondering like different ways to kind of clear mm -hmm. the joint. Yeah, it depends on how excruciating the pain is for the individual too. Like if you need something to take the edge off, it's it's an okay temporary fix, but we don't want to make it a long-term solution for it. So at the end of the day, getting more movement through the joint will actually circulate that swelling out of there and correct the problem for the long-term as well. So that's so exactly no what cortisone, they, uh, like you wouldn't do a cortisone shot in the toe? 
No, I wouldn't do a cortisone shot in the toe because over time, those cortisone shots just start to wear away at the tendons sure. and the ligaments anyway. So it's going to make the foot weaker and they likely already have a weaker foot. So we want to be able to try and strengthen up and be able to expose that joint through new ranges of motion as well. So with a, like a, I'm, I'm picturing a bunion right now. I'm picturing a, a toe that's kind of spread out, pressing over top of the other toes. And that means that you're closing down the joint on the very, um, on actually the lateral sides of the outside edge of that joint and opening it up in the middle. So you're getting a lot of compression at one side and a lot of stretching through the, the, the tissues, like the ligaments, the tendons, the muscles on the, the medial or inside as your joint. So what you'd want to be able to do is give that joint the opportunity to experience the other joint position. And that's what the toe spreaders will do. So you put those toe spreaders in, it will push the toe out and spread the foot. And now we can get those tissues that have been compressed and tissues that have been over lengthened to take a break. And we'll give them a new stimulus and then start to do a lot of these foot exercises, these foot movements like Caldiza stuff, these isometrics, uh, going through some of the active foot stuff that I do and the foot health uh, exercises and be able to now one, get the fluid out of the joint, but then two, improve the brain's picture of that joint. So now it can use it in regular movement and improve your gait pattern, improve all the regular movement patterns. So that becomes your new way of moving versus just continually pissing it off uh, until the end of your time. Can, can you talk a little bit about arthritis? I mean, uh, we talked about like, you know, the deteriorating of the joint surfaces and now all of a sudden those, you know, bones are kind of rubbing and it's causing a lot of that. But, uh, um, you know, people think that arthritis can't be reversed and a lot of times it can be managed, especially with like, for me, you know, the ar- arthritis in my knee doesn't bother me because I lift weights. The only time it doesn't bother yeah. me if I don't yeah, do some form of anything. loading on the joint, then I start getting this weird stiffness and I get like uh, a little swelling behind my knee. But if I go in and I squat heavy like I did yesterday, all of a sudden, man, it like, it gives me about seven days where like I'm fine. And if I just don't do it at like, or if I like miss two weeks, all of a sudden I start feeling this well. Is it a similar kind of a deal? Yeah, so that you're, we're talking about like the mechanical side of things. So the, the the mechanical loading can be the poison. It can also be the antidote, right? So in the case of a foot that doesn't know how to experience all those different ranges of motion and degrees of freedom, you'll start to get excessive mechanical loading that will start to aggravate and stimulate that arthritic process. Versus now, like you said, with your knee, you're loading it up, and that's actually you're loading it up in a use stress, so a beneficial way, which is one improving the brain's picture of it calming down the the pain alarm system and stimulating it in a way to where you are loading it to create a positive stress. And that's just that's just kind of one aspect of the arthritic kind of continuum. The other one that you kind of alluded to is the, like the diet and the lifestyle choices, right? So there is a genetic component of it to it as well, where people can be more gen- genetically predisposed to getting something like rheumatoid arthritis, which is actually an autoimmune condition. Um, But then what we're seeing is you can start to manage these arthritic symptoms by controlling the inflammation in the body, because what it comes down to is it's it's kind of systemic in nature as well. So if you are eating foods that aren't inflaming the shit out of your system and causing a cortisol spike, you can now lower the amount of cortisol reaction and the histamine reaction that's occurring in the joint. So. Eat better, right? No, I, I, yeah, it was it's funny. Real I was, simple shit. I was thinking about you yesterday as I was squatting. Uh, like my knee was feeling a little jammed up, and I was thinking, like, man, what? When you uh, had me on the table, and you're like, let me see how bad your knee is, and then you're like, your knee's terrible, but you have incredible uh, hip flexibility. No wonder you're able mm-hmm. to do all these things. And I was like, man, yeah. let me use some hip flexibility, and then all of a sudden, it just. <laughs> <laughs> I guess you got to use what you got. Uh, Isn't it amazing how the body responds? Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, like, dude, I, I got that bone chip in the back, man. That osteophyte that acts like a doorstop, but it doesn't stop me. Um, yeah, you is, got you got a legitimate mechanical block. <laughs> yeah, it's and I can feel it. Uh, is there um, would there ever be a point where like there becomes a mechanical block similar in the toe, and you might have to go in and I, I don't know what it would it's called, but it's I mean where they would recess bone in the or shave it down or do something in that way to kind of I mean is it a resection? I don't know what I yeah, forget so what it's re- remove bone. Continually loading the bone in that matter could develop something like a like a bone spur, right? To where you've now got excess bone in and around the joint, which essentially locks it down. And now you mechanically can't get any movement until you get somebody with a scalpel to go in there and like you said shave it down and be able to give you the mechanical ability to open that joint back up. But that that does take a long time of moving like an asshole to be able to develop that that bone formation in the back. And it could be stimulated from poor movement patterns or from something like a surgery 
as well, where they cause that mechanical stress into the joint and then the body responds in an excessive way by laying down um, new soft tissue that eventually becomes calcified into bone. Gotcha. Yeah. So they have, uh, I mean, so we, we kind of have a multi-pronged solution. One, we have to probably know the severity, but we have to start and look and say, all right, what are the injuries that might be contributing to those, fix those? We have to look at flexibility in the foot, whether or not there's a bunion, and then we have to take a look and say, how, how do we put a correct movement pattern together that reduces inflammation and tends to, you know, at least puts us in a direction of a healthier uh, foot and a healthier pattern. And then I guess if the arthritis is so bad that there's maybe a bone spur or some mechanical blockage, then you might have to see a, an orthopedic uh, surgeon who would go in and clean it out. And something really easy to do is look at what kind of shoes you're wearing too. So if and if it's environmentally driven by your shoe wear, I mean the toe box is so narrow that it's squishing your toes together, you could do all the movement that you want in the gym barefoot. But if the majority of your reps and steps throughout the day are going to be in those shoes, your body's never going to adapt in a positive way. It's always going to just revert back to the most comfortable position it has, which is that position it adopted while being in the shoes as well. So, And for reference, Matt, you wrote an article for PowerAthleteHQ.com entitled Shoes of the shoes Devil. Of the, devil. <laughs> the Devil, Bobby Boucher. Uh, something I was also thinking about as I was wearing those insoles and walking around, it uh, – like. I know you guys don't do it, but uh, have you guys ever walked any type of barefoot outside this building? Uh, yes. I recently <laughs> did uh, reverse med ball tosses, and the ball continued to roll down the hill. And then you ran out barefoot? <laughs> and I, Yes. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Like, it's almost like, cause, I mean, there's uh, everything from, Ooh. like, oak. Uh, like Snakes. Sna like, yeah, there's a lot of, like, spikes and a lot of, like, pain when you're walking. And I was wondering if, like, that was kind of, like, the same effect. No, well, but but think about it. Like think about before shoes, right? So you're walking around. Your feet get kind of accustomed to these different sensations as you're walking. Like, ooh, that's a spike. Ooh, that's a thorn. Okay, that feels. But you know, like you have these different kind of proprioception, um, like elements feeding into you. And now we kind of walk in this kind of smooth environment where we're on these cushy shoes. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that insole is kind of taking us back to a, and I hate the word primal, but like a, how about a, How about to better days? Yeah, to better days <laughs> when we didn't have to wear shoes. Uh, you know, kind of like, a, what's the show? Um, Naked and Afraid. Mm -hmm. Those poor people are like in South Africa and it's like 130 degrees and they're walking around bare at the foot and like thorn bushes. Yeah. Like that type of stuff. Ants crawling in their ass crack. For, I'm Is out. It, there's no way. <laughs> I'm out. Yeah, no, I, I do. Like the guy, like, game show. Like, we watched it with the kids, and these people didn't eat for like 12 days. Yeah, no. Give me some lemon meringue pie, two cups of coffee, <laughs> and some Tai Chi. <laughs> Matt, I've been observing some of the training exercises you provided Mr. Luke Summers here, mm. and they're oh, yes. very heavy in the active, active foot and planes of motion. Can mm -hmm. you mm -hmm. go back and explain how important planes of motion are for the feet? Because a lot of us that are on training programs just think squat, mm -hmm. step, lunge, but then you have to still planes of motion with the feet. Give us a crack course on that. Oh, sure. So that is actually going to the three different planes of motion work together in like a spiraling path pathway. So if you ever heard of Fibonacci sequence, it's everything in nature abides by this spiraling type of a pathway, a spiraling phenomena. The human body is the exact same way. So for example, we go back to our two different foot shapes, our pronation and our supination. When we are pronating the foot, which is broken up into the rear foot, the midfoot and the forefoot, they're going through and they're opposing each other. Okay, so as the knee starts to come out over the toe, starting at the rear foot, we should see that heel evert or actually kick out to the side, which is gonna be in that uh, rotational or that transverse plane, or sorry, the, uh, the frontal plane. And then the forefoot is going to have to invert. So it's gonna do the exact opposite of it. Okay? And then the toes are gonna to have to do the exact opposite of that and they're gonna evert as well. Which is why you kind of see the toes kind of spread and get longer and move out in this kind of like banana shape as you go into pronation. And then also in the sagittal plane or that forward backward type of motion, the calcaneus is now going to be plantar flexing. So it's going to be moving forward while the forefoot is actually dorsiflex, uh, midfoot and dor forefoot are actually dorsiflexing. But if you keep the big toe and the fifth toe down on the ground, that ground contact force is gonna oppose it. So the foot is actually gonna flatten down towards the ground. And then that last one is gonna be the transverse plane or the rotational. So that calcaneus is actually going to externally rotate, which is gonna allow the foot to internally rotate. And you can kind of see how this is all working. And then the exact opposite, that supination is the exact opposite spiraling pathway. 
So you get the inversion at calcaneus, the um, eversion of the forefoot, and then you get the dorsiflexion at calcaneus, plantar flexion of the forefoot, and that's where you get the different stimulation now up the rest of the chain that's gonna cause the tibia to internally or externally rotate, the femur to internally and externally rotate, and then the pelvis to either anteriorly or posteriorly rotate. Well. What's the benefit of having three pivot points in the foot? I mean, as I'm like listening to this, I'm like, well, man, like that, uh, like, is it uh, is it for gait? Is it for you know different uh, you know ankle, knee, hip joints? I'm just wondering, like, yeah. is there a, so, a practical need for it? Well, we have three different arches, right? Everybody's really only concerned about that medial arch, which is the one that gets all of the the kind of the press, right? But then we also have the lateral arch and the transverse arch. So all three of those actually come together to make that triangle. So we do have to hit the heel down, which is going to cause a stimulation, right? It's gonna cause a reflex to go out to the outside edge of the heel to hit the pinky toe, to then roll in to try and find that big toe as well. And that big toe and that pinky toe knuckle are the two most important ones because they connect that transverse arch and that transverse arch is actually one of the, I think it's the most important one. I think it's more important than the medial because that acts like a, it's a class two lever. So it acts like a wheelbarrow. So it's able to handle a lot, a lot of load because you have the, the fulcrum being the transverse arch and the load right behind it and the force, the big powerful force coming out of literally everything in the trans, in the posterior chain of the Achilles, the hamstrings and the glutes. There you go. And to simplify it for our listeners out there in the John Wellborn, just tell me what to do effect. <laughs> what are some examples? I've never said that. Well, just tell me what to eat. Just tell me what to eat. Well, just I've never asked that train. question. I've been asked that question numerous times. Yeah, you've and answered I'm, it that I'm way. I'm glad to give people that information. Right. Yeah. So give them that. And Matt, can you paint the picture verbally, some examples, and we can provide the movement videos in the show notes, but some of the cool transverse pl- transverse arch stuff or different triplanal arch development movements that you're presenting to give athletes like Luke. Yeah. So the stuff that I gave Luke is essentially looking at the three different or the different phases of gait as well. And then we're training those different phases of gait with different movements, moving through those three different planes of motion. But to simplify it, anytime the knee comes out over the toe, we should see that. So the knee's flexing, the knee's coming out of the toe. We should see that foot flattening towards the ground. And every time, anytime you're extending the knee with any pattern you do, we should see the arch lifting off the ground as well. So if you're not getting that, there's something mechanically not connected throughout the rest of the body. Now with something like Luke, we have him in a lot of split stance variations, which essentially simulating taking a step forward. So as that leg's coming forward, the knee's flexing, we're coming out over the toe, and then we can start to challenge the three different planes of motion with that pronation, that attenuating phase of gait. So we can start to then turn, obviously left versus right. We can then extend the pelvis, so dump it forward, pull it back. Or then I like taking the arm up overhead and doing the frontal plane and kind of side bending left and right. But all you're doing is essentially just shifting your center of mass around that base of support of the foot and challenging it Mm -hmm. and seeing how your body responds to it. And it's dope. Yeah. And I've seen you apply this tool with a professional football player. We'll name, leave his position and, and team out of it. Mm-hmm. But it was cool to see this individual react the way he did. Very switched on athlete. Yeah. And he asked a phenomenal question. And I've been asked this too. He was like, why, why can't I just do balance with BOSU ball and all those little mm-hmm. off-balance things? And you gave a phenomenal answer of the importance of a level ground. Can you share why... The BOSU ball balance stuff is a fallacy in training. You really want to get me up on a soapbox today, didn't you? Wind them up. <laughs> Your show, bro. Oh, man. Yeah, so big picture is the, the, the BOSU ball or those foam pads. They're essentially circus tricks, and they have no translation over into literally any type of sport or human movement. They just make you better at doing that circus trick because our foot is always going to be in, t- in touch with a hard surface. Right. So having the foot flat in the ground, we have to actually train the sensory stimulation into the bottom of the foot. That meaning the foot needs to be barefoot. And then also the uh, vestibular system. So what's going on in between the ears? And you could do things like different um, cognitive tasks, like having them solve a problem or change the eye movement. So looking up, down, side to side, or having to track something and, and tossing a ball, but having something where the foot is flat on the ground and then you're challenging it throughout these different constraints 
of maybe you're closing one eye, maybe you're having to challenge like decision making, or you're looking at different um, planes of motion with, with where, where the eyes are going. Because when in sport, you have to coordinate all that together. Like you picture that receiver running down the sideline, like he's going straight ahead, but his head's turned and his eyes are usually looking up towards the ball or not at all. And they're trying to have that kinesthetic awareness of being able to catch the ball in real time while trying to defend off defenders, right? All that the BOSU balls do, and we have clinical research to um, validate this as well, is, and this was actually my thesis at Duke, is that doing training, so six to eight weeks of training on a BOSU ball, it makes you better at joint position sense because of stimulating the big muscle groups, but it does not prevent successive ankle sprains whatsoever. Mm -hmm. It makes you no better at them. So then it comes to ask the question is like, why are we actually doing them in the first place? Where we do know is if we do stimulate the vestibular system, we do stimulate the sensory motor system through the, the uh, flat ground with maybe different textures underneath there is a great way to do it. We do have the ability then to get all those systems working together to reduce the risk of injury and mitigate it further. What about like a voodoo board? You know, like the skateboards that have like the different kind of round wheels underneath them, like the center, and it kind of goes back and forth. And I only think that because when I had my patellar tendon injury, they got me a voodoo board and they just let me take it home and I would use it. And I got to the point where uh, I could stand on it perfectly still and play video games and for like and 30 the- minutes and I could like would never get knocked off it. And uh, they were like, oh, is it working? I'm like, I don't notice anything. Right? But I can play video games all <laughs> well, day Well, it's doing something, right? It's, it's working something. Well, but like, that's, that's that. a fixed surface, but then you're having yeah. to kind of adjust and go back and forth. And so would something like that be more ap- applicable? Well, is, is it really fixed though? Right, so the board may be flat, but the surface underneath it is rocking yeah. back and forth. So I would say that has a, probably a little bit better of an application. I'm actually not familiar on the research on anything like that type of a voodoo board um, but in my mind it would be stimulating more of that those larger joint position sense um, reaction systems within the body versus the subtleties that are going on in the bottom of the foot well i feel like we've hammered this hammer toed it <laughs> no let me guess wow. nickname in college nickname in college hammer toe <laughs> everyone knows that oh it was limp brisket Oh yeah, that was no, that was high school. Oh, that was high school. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, hammer toes. Uh-huh. Reverse drag. What would I, what did I call you on Instagram? Uh, I don't know. Oh, it killed though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, you remember right. that one time? Yeah, that was so that funny. Was, that that was, awesome. was awesome. Well, oh, just reverse plow. Th- reverse plow. That was my nickname <laughs> in grade school. Um, the uh, Justin, there you go, buddy. We've got tons of information for Justin you. Justin from Australia. From to, Australia. Yeah. To put it on the shrimp from... on the bobe. <laughs> I'm like, wow, like we wouldn't have known he was from Australia. Uh-huh. Thanks for telling us. And uh, I guess one thing that he did ask is, let's say yep. this isn't good enough. Who can he go to for help? And Z, that's why you're on the call, man. So yep. Justin, look up uh, I was gonna Dr. Zanis on. <laughs> Zanis, who do you recommend? Yeah, look up Dr. Zanis on, <laughs> look up Dr. I, I know on, on Instagram. Yeah, 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 I know a dude. Yeah, I know so, a guy. so look up Rooted in Movement. Uh, mm-hmm. And you'll find Z and hit, you know, hit him up on, I don't know, DM, you want email? What do you want? Yeah, DM will work. That's usually the fastest way to get a hold of me. Okay, cool, cool. And uh, and we'll spread the word as well on Field Strong. We got anything else? Nope. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thanks for listening to another episode of the Premier Podcast in Strength and Conditioning. Ing. Ing. Ha <laughs> ha. That's right. Hotline's open. If you've got questions, we've got answers. If we don't have the answers, we've got the people. Call us at 929-464-4640. That's 929-copiers. <laughs> no. Ing, ing. Oh, yeah. Go. I mean, that's zero. That's 929. Ing, ing, zero. Go. Thanks, people. See you, Matt. Bye. Thanks. Yep. Now it's time for you to empower your performance. Head to PowerAthleteHQ.com backslash training to choose from a number of programs to meet your specific performance goals. And if you like to break a mental sweat too, visit Academy.PowerAthleteHQ.com and become a real stakeholder in you or your athlete's success. Until next time, bye!